I'm sure we've all heard of the saying, knowledge is power, and that certainly holds true for the cybersecurity or cyber industry. Having information and awareness about our adversaries allows us to prepare for what they may or may not do as it relates to our organization. Now, cyber threat intelligence requires that we are prepared to use that information. If our organization is suffering from an inability to identify and manage risk, we can't consume intelligence and make that actionable within our network because we simply lack the tools and maturity from a security standpoint to use this information as intended. It would be more of a distraction to start throwing cyber threat intelligence on top of all of the other problems. And what that really means is if we're struggling to detect common threats on our network and we're struggling with visibility issues, we have terribly segmented networks, we are missing a lot of visibility in our network, it's gonna be that much harder to correlate what's going on in the greater cyberspace, the greater community, or even within a particular market that our business may operate in, and how we correlate those trends as to what we are seeing. And that's a key point there. If we can't see in our network, we can't correlate those trends. So that begs the question, what is cyber threat intelligence? And it's simply data that is collected, processed, and analyzed that allows us to understand what our adversaries, those threat actors, what their motivations are, and what targets they're going after. An example might be a threat intelligence report may relate that a Chinese adversary, a known threat actor group, is looking for information regarding directed energy weapons. So if we were a research university working with lasers and other technologies that relate to those points of interest for that adversary, we could safely assume that we may be a target of that adversary. And the correlated cyber threat intelligence around that threat actor would become very pertinent and important as to how we prepare to defend against those types of techniques and procedures that that adversary may employ against us. So intelligence is nothing new. It's been used for thousands of years and it's still used today and it's used to help us understand both what our adversaries and allies are doing we want to make sure that our allies of course are still our allies and we want to know what the capabilities of our adversaries are in the case of cyber threat intelligence we're more focused on adversaries of course and we want to know what adversaries are doing how they operate what their goals and motivations are what geopolitical references are associated with these adversaries and how does that impact us as an organization. So all of that contextual information, whether it be strategic or nitty gritty down into the tactical technical level, that's all completely relevant at different phases of our planning and risk assessment process, right? We need to understand at a high strategic level what threat actors are doing, but we need to also know the nitty gritty details about how they employ these techniques so that we can look for these techniques and events within our network. And when we get down to the technical and tactical layers of threat intelligence, that information really supports threat hunting. Threat hunting would be the act of proactively looking for those events within our network. But threat intelligence is the process of sourcing, analyzing, and preparing this information for dissemination so that it can be used by those individuals to include high-level decision makers down to junior level and senior SOC analysts and operational security folks, as well as the threat hunters who are proactively looking in our network for indicators of these adversaries. So all of that's coming together to help us improve our security program and being more proactive towards identifying these threats and hopefully finding them quicker than the typical average of around 60 days or so before they're typically detected. So being proactive allows us to go out there, look for this stuff, these adversaries, and remove them from our networks. Otherwise, we're just hoping and praying that our preventative tools are gonna do their job. And we can't really rely on that because adversaries are smart and adversaries build tools and capabilities to evade typical detection means. So sometimes we just have to get the information and sort of go in manual and start looking for this stuff in our network. Prior to available cyber threat intelligence, organizations had to rely on their best business practices and cybersecurity hygiene fundamentals to try to protect their network. Whether they did that poorly or well was really up to their, their security program maturity. But the problem was is that these, these processes were based upon general detection and prevention. And the process there is as organizations became targeted, these targeted threats were able to evade these preventative technologies. So the power of cyber threat intelligence has aided these organizations in being able to assess not only their risk, but align that risk to a known adversary. And in doing so, 
optimize or tune their defensive posture to protect and defend against those types of threats. So instead of being reactionary and just hoping that our layered defense, our defense in depth is doing what it can and, and the best it can be to stop everything, we were able to focus on various particular threats and reduce the risk of those threats causing an adverse effect in our network. And that started to also mature the reality that our networks are going to be compromised and we need to not just plan that it will never occur, but prepare for the fact that when it happens, we are able to detect, contain, and remediate quickly. And that whole mentality, that change, was brought about also around the time of the you know, first APT report, that Advanced Persistent One uh, Mandiant report that was released, and the emergence of cyber threat intelligence that started to show up in the market in, in the various conferences a few years later. So prior to cyber threat intelligence, organizations did have information on threats, but it wasn't formalized. There wasn't processes. There wasn't dissemination and sharing methods. So a lot of information was very siloed, and there was a lot of you know corporate knowledge that was tied up in very specific industries. And what happened was organizations that had lots of money or capability knew a lot of things, and generally everybody else knew little to nothing. And the reason was that is because most information was gathered through these non-repetitive engagements. We were breached, we did an investigation, we learned something. We would use that information to improve things, but that's really where it stopped. We didn't go beyond and try to source and correlate that to other new information and build a more intelligence process. And that sort of led to the reality that there was no real information sources or collection systems for intelligence or driving that intelligence process. And because we didn't have that information or the sources and methods, we were unable to assess and improve our knowledge gap as to what can we currently detect versus what is capable out there. We now know that there's adversaries that could do all of these rather technical and in some cases frightening things. And what is the relationship to those capabilities and to our network? Are we a prime target for that adversary? And cyber threat intelligence has been able to help us answer some of those questions that we previously had no awareness of. With all that being said, cyber threat intelligence processes, capabilities, and what exists out there on the market are still maturing. It's still a new capability, and a lot of organizations are struggling to really understand what is cyber threat intelligence. There's many organizations that don't fully understand how it can be used, and Unfortunately, they're buying cyber threat intelligence data and they're sort of just pouring it on their security program. It's the equivalent of your house is on fire and you call the fire department and when they pull up instead of using their truck, they grab your garden hose and try to put out your house fire. You have the right skills and tools, but you're not really putting them into use. The fire truck's not getting used. And that's sort of what happens in a lot of organizations. They sort of get hyped up about, you know, oh, we're going to learn about adversaries and how they hack organizations. But beyond the sexiness factor of it, nobody's aligning those adversaries to their risk profiles. Nobody's building knowledge gap assessments of their organization. Nobody is assessing what their sources and methods are for collecting and disseminating information within their organization. And on top of that, there's nobody in the organization who's tasked with receiving that disseminated information and doing something about it. So again, it's like the fireman with a garden hose. You got the right stuff in, in the right area, but you're not doing it right. And it just costs a lot of money. It looks cool, but it's not getting the job done. And with that being said, there are many commercial and open source solutions and tools that exist. There's just a lot of noise regarding how these tools should or shouldn't be used in an organization. And there is no really well-defined process. Every organization you go to will have a completely different understanding of what cyber threat intelligence is what tools they need, and how that information and processes are applied within their organization. And due to this lack of standardization, there is really a bunch of gaps in just those processes, not even thinking about the knowledge gaps in our security program, but the gaps in how we conduct CTI in the organization is still flawed. And because it's still flawed, adversaries are still successful. So it will take some time to improve our processes. No organization can just bring on this whole capability, bolt it on really quick and just be up and running. It takes people, it takes skill, it takes training, but we still need to be aware of that just because we buy solutions and tools and just because we train people does not mean we flipped a switch and things are fixed. It will take time, it takes repetition, and it takes that feedback loop to improve and adjust. Also, good intelligence is the result of analyzed information. And really, what does that mean? It, we're finding good sources of information and data. We're analyzing that, and we're putting it in the formats that are 
designed for a particular audience. Additionally, good threat intelligence is information that allows a decision maker to make that a decision. If we do not understand the capabilities and intents of our adversaries, knowing all the deeper technical details don't mean much because we're not successfully aligning our defensive posture to the adversaries that may cause us the most harm. So information has to be disseminated appropriately to the appropriate audience and communicated in a certain format and in a certain way that these audiences can digest that information. Strategic leaders are looking for strategic, high-level information, broad strokes, general trends, and awareness, whereas security and cyber defense analysts are looking for technical information so that they can implement detection methodologies and preventative measures to reduce the likelihood of these adversaries being successful in breaching the network. Ultimately, like we've been talking about, threat intelligence provides us with adversary awareness, and specifically, it helps us understand the adversary's tactics, techniques, and procedures. These are the tools, the methods, and the decision-making process that adversaries go through to pick their targets, identify what information they're going to take, and what tools and tactics and techniques they're going to use to accomplish those goals. If we don't understand our adversary's decision-making process and the tools or methods they're going to use, we simply can't align our threat intelligence sources to our appropriate defensive strategy. We have to have those in alignment, and that requires us having a good risk assessment, a knowledge gap assessment, an alignment of known adversaries that are highly likely to attack our organization, and a cross-reference with their TTPs. All of that information disseminated to the right stakeholders allows us to prepare our defenses and response strategies for these eventual attacks. Now, adversary awareness is fantastic, but there is an area where this gets very subjective and starts to muddy the water here a little bit. When we talk about attribution, and the correlation of geopolitical events to help aid in attribution, that's when things can get a little bit more challenging. Many organizations want to use cyber threat intelligence so they could, you know, wave a flag and say China hacked us or Iran hacked us or Russia hacked us or any of the other nation states that exist out there. And that is somewhat dangerous to sort of go into that process thinking that. Remember, we talked previously about confirmation bias. We don't want to enter this process assuming we know who the threat actor is and we're going to use this threat intelligence as a means to validate our assumptions or confirm our bias. Also remember that IP addresses, domain names, this other technical data, it's very easy to obfuscate this information. It's very easy for a US APT to operate out of Chinese IPs and vice versa. It's very easy to route traffic through Eastern Europe and Russia before I attack somewhere. So we use threat intelligence, which may provide indicators or indications of attribution, but until we have an overwhelming amount of data, an overwhelming amount of data from multiple sources of high confidence correlation and analysis, we simply can't go down the path of attribution because that gets very, very dangerous. It leads us to focus on threats that may not be of a real threat to our organization. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources. And at the end of the day, we might be protecting ourselves from attacks that will never come, whereas we lost sight of our true adversaries and they had no problem compromising and gaining access to the network and destroying everything we had been working towards. So it's very important that cyber threat intelligence will help in guiding us towards attribution, but we need an overwhelming amount of data to make that happen. And most attribution that is done sort of in the industry with some level of confidence and agreeance is by vendors, because remember, a vendor is seeing thousands of deployments of their tools, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of deployments of their tools. Think of antivirus. You know, McAfee has millions of antivirus deployments around the world. They have a very unique picture of what's going on, and their insights their telemetry, their data, their th sources of intelligence are much better than any singular organization. So their ability to do attribution is much more powerful than our organization's ability to do that. So we need to refrain from going down this attribution path. We can be aware of it and we can put it in up some perspective as to what we think may be happening, but we've got to let the people who have the appropriate data do that work. 
Now, that's not to say we can't do attribution. There are many times there are very unique tags that are very specific to a known threat actor group. And if we experience those, we are more likely able to go down that path of stating this is attributable to that group. But unless you deal with that kind of an event, we must refrain from going down the path and saying, well, I saw a Chinese IP, obviously we're being attacked by China. That is a bias that we don't want to get ourselves trapped in.